Okay, so welcome uh, to this uh, uh, hybrid edition of uh, Complex Analysis and Geometry 25th. And it's my great pleasure to introduce the first lecturer of today, Jean-Pierre de Magui, who's going to talk about L2 extension theorems and applications to algebraic geometry. Uh, thank you very much, Filippo. Good morning to everyone. So. Um... I'm glad to give these lectures, although uh, it would be even better if I could have come to uh, Grand Hotel Bella, Bella Vista, but uh, anyway, uh, I'm sure uh, everything will go well. So I'm going to uh, explain as essentially a, a recent results around L2 extension theorems in the vein of the Ozawa Takegoshi extension theorem. Uh, but there have been many work in the, in the last years, and hopefully we have now more general and more powerful uh, statements. So I will try to give details about this. So the, the general plan of my lectures, uh, first, a, uh, in the first lecture, essentially I will concentrate on a qualitative extension theorem that is fairly general, but uh, unfortunately, at this point, does not provide a, a very effective uh, L2 estimate. Actually, the L2 estimates are used in the proof, but in the end, uh, the L2 estimate is lost, as you will see. And so I will uh, give the main ideas uh, today uh, of, of the proof. Uh, so tomorrow, in the second lecture, I will concentrate on a case where, uh, on the other hand, we have an L2 estimate. And this L2 estimate contains, of course, the original uh, Ozawa Takegoshi extension theorem, as well as recent results, and also uh, as was obtained uh, by Botsky, uh, Guan, Zhou, uh, and others, um, the, the optimal constants so that uh, one can get a proof of the sweeter conjecture. And in the third lecture, I will present uh, further applications. Uh, for instance, um, well, the approximation theory of uh, quasi peripheronic functions and currents, and the solution of the strong openness conjecture by Guan and Zhou. OK, so that's a general plan. So uh, let me first. Uh, introduce the general notation I will use. So throughout the lectures, x omega will be a uh, Kähler manifold uh, of dimension n, and uh, it will be possibly non-compact, but then uh, if, if non-compact, we usually assume some sort of uh, pseudo-convexity or holomorphic convexity. I will make this precise later. So we take L to be a holomorphic line bundle on X, and it is equipped with a uh, Hermitian metric, which locally is written by a weight. And we assume this weight to be locally integrable. That's the minimal assumption we have uh, so that we can compute the curvature form in the sense of uh, currents, which means that we simply apply distribution theory to compute the derivatives of the function, which is supposed to be locally integrable, so it defines a distribution, okay? Now, uh, we usually need the positivity assumptions for the line bundle, so let me recall that uh, a bundle L is said to be positive if there exists a smooth metric, smooth metric, such that uh, the curvature form here is a positive definite one one form on X. And by Kodaira in the compact case, uh, this is equivalent to L being ample. Uh, we say that L is NEF, uh, numerically eventually free or numerically effective sometimes, if for every epsilon positive, uh, there exists a smooth metric H epsilon, such that the curvature form, uh, which depends now on H epsilons, so you have a weight uh, phi epsilon, is uh, 
not too negative, is larger than minus epsilon omega. Uh, in the projective case, this is actually equivalent to the usual uh, definition of algebraic geometers, that the degree on curves is non-negative. And finally, the bundle is said to be pseudo-effective if, uh, in fact, one can find a singular metric which produces a, a semi-positive curvature current. So equivalently, uh, this means that there exists a current T in the first chunk class of L, uh, which is uh, non-negative. Okay, T is non-negative. Uh, now we are going to consider extensions. So um, we want to be fairly general. So we consider a subvariety Y defined by some uh, coherent ideal sheaf, but we don't necessarily assume uh, the subvariety to be reduced. So in other words, the ideal J here may have nilpotent elements. And we consider the structure sheaf here on Y, which is the quotient of OX by, by J. And now um, the extension problem can be rephrased in terms of the exact sequence. Zero goes to J, goes to structure sheaf OX, goes to the quotient OX over J, which is just the same as OY. Okay, and then we twist, we twist this by uh, the tensor product, well, the locally free sheaf of sections of Kx tensor L, where Kx is the canonical bundle, so lambda n of the cotangent bundle, and the given line bundle L. And then one gets an, a long exact sequence of cohomology groups. Uh, here, I start with this, OX, so you get KX tensor L, and then you go into uh, KX tensor L twisted by OX divided by J. And then you go to the next uh, HQ plus one, uh, OX KX tensor L twisted by the ideal J here. Uh, now, this term here, this term, of course, can be viewed with the, re the non necessarily reduced structure as a cohomology class over Y of KX tensor L restricted to Y by definition of the structure sheaf. Okay, so this term uh, can be viewed as something on Y. And uh, now you wonder whether the restriction morphism is subjective. Of course, by the long exact sequence, this, the subjectivity of this arrow here is equivalent to the injectivity of the next arrow here. So um, it's equivalent to have that the morphism from HQ plus one K extensor L tensor J into K extensor L is injective. Um, and for this, we are going to use uh, some special ideal sheaves. Not, not all sheaves will be uh, acceptable. So uh, we start with a Hermitian metric, um, exponential minus phi, with phi quasi plurisubharmonic. So quasi plurisubharmonic means plurisubharmonic plus a smooth term. And to any such function, we consider the associated multiplier ideal sheaf, I of exponential minus phi, which is defined by its terms. So it's a set of terms of holomorphic functions that are exactly locally L2 on some small neighborhood of the point X0 uh, with respect to the weight exponential minus phi. And uh, by Nadel, uh, this is always a coherent ideal sheaf. Uh, I will not give the proof here. Uh, well, there are many lecture notes on this. Uh, it depends essentially on uh, L2 estimates. So you can derive this from Hormanda's L2 estimates, for instance, applied locally in balls. Uh, moreover, it's not just coherent. In fact, it's always integrally closed. So when you have an ideal, uh, you can consider the, um, the integral closure, which is the set of um, of uh, 
elements that satisfy some integral equation with coefficients in the powers of the ideal. Uh, so it's, for instance, uh, if you take the integral closure of z1 square z2 square, uh, you get an additional element, which is z1 z2, okay? And a z1 z2 actually has a similar size to z1 square and z2 square. So in fact, the integral closure means that you add all, all holomorphic functions that are bounded by the generators or the sum of uh, absolute values of the generators. Okay, I'm, I'm going also to use frequently uh, functions with analytic singularity. So it means that I'm considering special quasi parisimonic functions that are locally uh, logarithm of sum of squares of holomorphic functions multiplied by a positive constant here, plus some smooth term, okay, u on the neighborhood of the point. And uh, well, a typical example, if when you take a, a section of a vector bundle E and a Hermitian metric, and you take the log of the square of the norm. Okay, now you have the well-known Nadal vanishing theorem. So in case you have a Keller manifold that you assume to be weakly pseudo-convex, so I mean by this that uh, X admits a smooth Clarissa harmonic exhaustion gamma. Uh, and then you consider a line bundle L with a singular Hermitian metric. And now you assume, you assume that the curvature form in the sense of currents is positive definite. Of course, X is not necessarily compact, so uh, it may decay at infinity. So you have a continuous positive function uh, alpha and theta LH is supposed to be at least equal to alpha omega. And then uh, the cohomology group HQ of XK X tensor L tensor I of H vanishes for Q at least one. So again, uh, this is a, essentially a direct consequence of Hormonda's uh, L2 estimates uh, with singular weights plus uh, basic sheaf theory. So you consider the, the sheaf of, of locally L2 sections with a D bar operator and you apply Omanda's estimate. So I'm not going to assume that the audience is familiar with this sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, and now I'm adding an extra an extra weight psi and assume that the curvature theta LH plus I del del bar psi is positive, uh, same lower bound alpha omega. Then, of course, it means that uh, you get a new, you have actually a new metric which is twisted by this weight, and uh, that this new metric has the corresponding curvature. So by Nadal, you get, of course, that uh, this group is zero for uh, degrees at least one. And now you consider the exact sequence, which is obtained from these two multiply ideal sheaves. So of course, this one here, you have more singularities, so uh, you get an inclusion of this multiplied ideal sheet into I of H, because here you add possibly some poles, so you have less, you have less pluris-harmonic function that are L2, so you get a, a sub-ideal, and then you get this uh, short exact sequence, and this short exact sequence gives you an arrow, and now by Nadal, the HQ plus one of this term here twisted by chaos, tensor L will be zero. And therefore you get the subjective morphism. So that's of course a, a, a sufficient condition for getting a subjective uh, morphism. But then uh, you get an extremely restrictive condition that you have strict positive curvature, strictly positive curvature. Uh, this is what you don't want to assume in fact. So of course this is good enough for, for a number of applications when you have uh, positive definite line bundles, uh, ample line bundles, of course. But here we are going to consider very subtle theorems 
where you want to use only semi-positivity. And uh, of course, you don't want to, to make such an assumption then. Okay, so we would like to relax this uh, strict positivity assumption. And the motivation, uh, well, there are many uh, open problems in algebraic geometry. For instance, the abundance conjecture, I will briefly recall uh, this thing. And also it's related to some questions in uh, the minimal model program. So take a projective manifold. It could be also in some cases, just scalar. Um, at this point, mostly only the case of general type varieties is no. Uh, the MMP for, for uh, general projective varieties is still to be established. And then uh, you consider uh, the Kodaira Itaka dimension, kappa of L. So kappa of L counts asymptotically the growth of sections of the multiples of a line bundle. So you essentially, uh, the, uh, the sections grow at least for some subsequence up, uh, up to a constant C as the exponent M raised to kappa of L. And this kappa of L is either minus infinity or an integer. And on the other hand, you have the numerical dimension, which somehow is the maximum exponent for which you get positive intersections for positive currents. So here I will not really explain how you define this. So this is in Buxom's uh, sense. So in case, in case you have, say, uh, numerically effective, you can take the ordinary uh, power of the, uh, of the chunk class. Uh, in case you're pseudo effective, it's slightly more subtle. So maybe I will come back to this at the end uh, of the third lecture. But anyway, using this, you can define a numerical dimension, which is somehow the, the maximal power of the first chunk class, which is non zero. And it is well known that the kappa of L is always bounded by the numerical dimension of L, both being between minus infinity and dimension N of the manifold. And a bundle is said to be abundant if you have actually equality. So you have as many sections somehow as predicted by the numerical properties of L. Uh, the fundamental abundance conjecture can be stated that for any uh, KLT pair, so, well, well, you have a condition on a um, divisor delta, for instance, a normal crossing divisor with um, coefficients between zero and one, strictly less than one. Uh, then uh, the, the Q line bundle KX plus delta is abundant. That's a fundamental unsolved uh, conjecture at this point. And you see that here you have to deal with uh, bundles that are not necessarily uh, strictly positive because uh, in fact, if numerical dimension is N, then you are big. So you have strictly positive curvature, but as soon, as soon as the numerical dimension is strictly less than N, in fact, uh, the problem means that you only have uh, weakly positive curvature. So for all of this sort of problems, you definitely need theorems for which uh, semi-positivity uh, is uh, cannot be improved. Uh, well, I will not go really into this, but you would like to have some sort of base point free theorem. So many works on this, uh, by BCHM, of course, uh, Birk Cassini, uh, Aiken, McKernan. And more recent work which I've done with Haken and Paon, and also even more recent by Fujino, Gongyo, Takeyama. Uh, so here you see the standard base point free theorem. So you assume that uh, you have a KLT pair such that L minus KX plus delta is nef and big. So big means that you have strictly positive curvature in the sense of currents. Uh, then L should be semi ample, namely ML. Uh, should be generated by sections, so base point free for a some multiple M. Uh, we can uh, try to have some sort of weak positivity variant. 
so assume that the manifold is not uniruled, so not, not covered by, by rational curves. And we proved uh, long ago that this is equivalent to Kx being pseudo effective. So uh, I defined uh, previously. And assume that L minus some multiple of Kx, some small multiple epsilon Kx is pseudo effective. Then the question is, can one prove that L is abundant modulo addition by a uh, flat line bundle? So G in pick zero of zero, zero trend class. So zero trend class means that uh, C1 of G is zero here. So up to a, a class, a zero class here, L should be abundant. That would be a weak positivity variant. And for all those applications, we need, again, uh, results on semi-positive bundles. OK, I'm not going to, to be very long on this sort of applications. And now let me uh, state the general qualitative extension theorem I have in mind. So I will follow essentially the recent work by Shang Yu Zhou and Lan Feng Zhu, uh, which is the culmination of many previous works. So essentially by Ozawa Takeguchi and Ozawa, and then also worked in 2017 with uh, Tao and Matsumura on, on, on such uh, extensions. Okay, so here is a statement. So you take a holomorphically convex Kähler manifold X omega, L a line bundle. And again, you take a singular Hermitian metric, which is given by a weight with respect to a smooth metric, okay, H0. And the weight phi is supposed to be quasi parisimbarmonic. And then you take another weight, psi, which is assumed to be locally integrable. Now assume that there exists a positive continuous function on X, such that when you add I del del bar psi to the curvature of H, you get something uh, non-negative, but here you have a coefficient that is either one or one plus alpha. Okay, so you need a coefficient that is slightly larger than one. So nu here is going to be either zero or one. So if nu is zero, uh, the coefficient is just one. But if nu is one, uh, then my assumption is that I have a coefficient that is strictly larger than one. Okay, so you have two conditions actually. Okay, now assuming this, uh, for all integers Q, so all commodity groups HQ, you have a subjective morphism from uh, HQ of KX tensor L tensor I of H into HQ of KX tensor L tensor, the quotient of the ideal sheaves i of h by i of h exponential minus psi. And what is the interpretation of this? So this quotient of ideals actually is supported on a subvariety because essentially, well, the ideal of course is equal to O of x uh, generically. Uh, so it is uh, non-zero only on a subvariety. And this variety Y actually is defined by what we call the conductor ideal. So the conductor ideal uh, JY, which is denoted as a quotient of I H exponential minus psi by I of H by definition consists of those functions F such that if you multiply I of H by F, then you get into the smaller ideal i of h expansion minus psi. So f should vanish somehow where psi has sufficient singularities to, uh, to make this ideal strictly smaller than i of h, okay? 
So this is the so-called conductor idea. And you can view this actually as some sort of section of K extensor L on Y uh, twisted by I rich. Okay, uh, let me, for instance, uh, explain a simple algebraic corollary. Uh, in the case where Y is simply a, no a simple normal crossing divisor. So you take some Y to be sum of MJ, YJ with integer multiplicities uh, non zero. And then uh, you have the ideal sheaf here uh, defined by this divisor. And then the non necessarily reduced uh, quotient structure sheaf OY associated with this divisor. And then you are going to take psi to be defined by um, the canonical sections of the components YJ. Uh, so they have logarithmic singularities, uh, they, van uh, they have minus infinity poles here along YJ with some coefficient CJ which can be a real number now, but you assume that the, uh, the integer part uh, CJ is an integer MJ positive, okay? And, here. and HJ will be any choice of smooth Hermitian matrix on the corresponding um, line bundles associated to the components. Now by the Le Long Poincaré here, uh, Le Long Poincaré equation, uh, the I del del bar of psi is uh, sum of CJ times two pi times current of integration on YJ minus uh, the curvature of uh, O of YJ with respect to this metric HJ. And now uh, the previous statement can be uh, restated like this. Of course, you uh, you need uh, well this this essentially is what you obtain from uh, from these bundles. Okay, so you have to subtract th this thing here. When you add i del del bar psi you have to subtract the corresponding curvature here, and this is why you have to consider as divisors, as Q divisors, L minus one plus new alpha. So alpha here is a constant, uh, sum of CJ, YJ. So you get Q divisors. Uh, let us assume that these divisors are numerically equivalent to semi-ample divisors. So it means that they are linearly equivalent up to elements of big zero. Uh, then the restriction morphism from, uh, from X to Y for the, uh, for the bundle uh, K extensor Y is subjective. So now this is a purely algebraic statement. You have no more uh, analytic definition. And uh, that's a very straightforward rephrasing of the previous theorem, um, because as you see, um, well, th this will provide, semi ampleness will provide uh, curvature on GJ, which is semi-positive. Uh, the pick zero provides zero curvature. So it, and this provides precisely the condition that theta LH plus the one plus new alpha times uh, I del del bar psi will be, will be actually non-negative with this, uh, if you use this. Of course, you have an additional uh, yj, which is positive here. Of course, you, this sum includes the current of integration on yj, but anyway, it's a non-negative current. Uh, in fact, when psi has analytic singularities, you can always use uh, Hironaka's theorem and a reduction of the singularities to divisors by blowing up. Uh, in fact, this result 
is not so much uh, less general uh, when psi has an LTX singularity, except that the positivity is a bit stronger. You assume, you assume semi-ample, whereas uh, semi-positive would be enough. But uh, apart from this, essentially, it's very close. Okay, I'm now in the rest of, uh, of the lecture today. Okay, so maybe it's a good point to ask whether uh, the audience has any questions, I don't know. Uh, so maybe it would be good if people ask question if they feel they need some, some explanations. Okay, uh, well, if not, uh, I'm going to try to explain uh, the proof of the general qualitative theorem. So the proof is by, uh, by Joe and, and Sue, Joe. Um, of course, improving on a lot of uh, previous work by other people. So the first basic idea is that if we want, if we want only a qualitative result, so no, uh, no L2 bounds, so in fact, approximate solutions will suffice, as I will explain. In that case, we assume the manifold X to be holomorphically convex. And then by the carton remert theorem, uh, X being holomorphically convex, you can take this as a definition alternatively. Uh, this means that X admits a proper holomorphic map P onto a Stein mm. complex space. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. There is a there question is on the chat. chat. Okay, question of the chat. So let me look at the chat. Uh, so where is it? More chat. Okay. Okay, so the question is, we want a quantitative, quantitative version. Uh, so, but the quantitative version I will discuss tomorrow. And uh, for the quantitative version, we definitely need more restrictive uh, conditions. What, what's surprising, what's surprising is that if we only want a subjectivity theorem without L2 estimates, then we can relax a lot in some sense, we can relax a lot the requirements. Uh, that's a bit surprising. Maybe, maybe we could still recover some sort of L2 estimates with these weaker conditions, but this is a very open problem. So, um, of course, I will discuss this later. Uh, there are a lot of issues that are completely unsolved. But today I'm concentrating on the qualitative results. So, no, no. L2 estimate except in the proof, which will be lost at the end of the proof. Okay, so let us assume that X emits a proper holomorphic map onto a Stein complex space. And then the observation is that the cohomology of all coherent sheaves is always Hausdorff. In fact, suppose you have a coherent sheaf F Okay, on X, then you can put a topology, for instance, by uh, computing with Cheshko chains, and then you use the topology of local uniform convergence on the cochains, and you take uh, the, the quotient of, you take a Stein covering, say, and then you take the quotient of the cocycles by the co-boundaries. And, uh, this topology is Hausdorff, which means that the co-boundaries actually are closed in the co-cycles. And the proof is very simple. Well, if you, if you use the very deep uh, direct image theorem, in fact, uh, by the Lure spectral sequence and the coherence of the direct images, uh, the Q's cohomology of X into F 
is just the space of holomorphic sections of the base S into uh, the Q's direct image, P lower star of F. But this is a space of sections of a holomorphic uh, analytic coherent sheaf, and this, therefore it's a fresh space. And actually you can see, uh, you have to look into the proofs that this is a topological isomorphism. So it's not just an isomorphism, it's a topological isomorphism. And therefore you get a fresh space and therefore it's Hausdorff. Okay, uh, I will not give the details here. You really have to go into a, a proof to get this. And uh, sim uh, an, uh, an equivalent statement is that the co-boundaries are closed in the co-cycles. But now I'm going to use Dolbo homology. And the corollary of what I've said is that if we want to solve a, a D-bar equation, D-bar U is V on a holomorphically convex manifold X, actually you don't have to solve it exactly, but you, you only need to solve it approximately. So namely that you can find an approximate solution U epsilon such that del bar U epsilon is V plus an error here. So the W epsilon is an error which has to go to zero as epsilon goes to zero. Then you show that V is in the closure of the co-boundaries, but since they are closed, uh, you will you will get the solution. And the the point here is that we are going to prove this by L two estimates, but and you will have to show that W epsilon goes to zero. But the point is that you will not have control on U epsilon. So the U epsilon may very well blow up and have a norm that goes to infinity. And then in the end, you don't get a solution with an L2 bound, but you still get the qualitative result. So this is exactly the situation that we will have in the proof. Okay, so we have an approximate solution, but uh, its L2 norm will explode, possibly. Okay, so now the next uh, useful tool is a twisted uh, bochner kodairana kano inequality that is essentially due to Ozawa and Takegoshi. Uh, so uh, you take a Keller manifold and then you take some positive or differentiable uh, differentiable functions, eta and lambda, that you will use to twist uh, the usual Bochner formula. So I will not compute this. So this has been uh, computed uh, more than 30 years ago by uh, in the original Zawa Takegoshi paper and then improved gradually. Okay, so you take the square of the norm of del bar star multiplied by the square root of eta plus lambda. Here, del bar u multiplied by square root of eta, del u multiplied by square root of lambda, and then the derivative del eta which u multiplied by lambda to the minus one half. Okay, with, uh, you add up everything. And then, uh, well, it's, you have to compute a lot, of course, and then you get something that is essentially a curvature tensor, but with the twist. So here U is any PQ form with values in L. And so I get a, uh, some sort of curvature tensor depending on PQ, depending on the line bundle L, depending on the metric H, depending on the kilometric omega, and depending on the twisting factors eta and lambda, okay? And the precise formula uh, is you get the, commutator bracket of the left shed operator. So uh, here it's the dual of, as usual, the dual of uh, multiplication by uh, omega, the left shed operator, so that's a dual. So it's of type minus one, minus one, as usual in KLR geometry. 
And then uh, you have essentially a twisted, a twisted curvature tensor here, one one form. which is a curvature of L, but multiplied by eta. So this will be very useful because we can somehow increase the curvature of L by a factor eta, which is essentially arbitrary, at the expense of losing a little bit of positivity because you have to subtract the delta bar of eta and then um, the derivatives of eta, but they can be divided by lambda. Okay, so that's, there are a lot of adjustments here. So it's a very subtle uh, calculation, but I will completely omit because it's, it's just a straightforward, although very clever uh, calculation. Uh, in the sequel, we will need on this, only this for NQ forms. So uh, P is N. Uh, we will choose the factor so that this is almost non-negative. Actually, we will need slightly negative, uh, but very close to being uh, semi-positive. And uh, the fact that it will, it will have to be taken slightly negative is because of, of the errors, uh, okay, the approximations. Okay, but nevertheless, this provides an L2 existence theorem with error terms. So assume that this B here, which I've introduced, is not too negative. So it's larger than minus epsilon over two times identity. Okay, so when you add epsilon identity, now it becomes strictly positive. So this is the basic assumption. Okay. Uh, now, you want to solve uh, an equation, you want to solve an equation del bar u is v, and you won't succeed because you will have to make an error. But then you assume that you have an L2 bound on v, uh, where here you have the inverse of the curvature somehow, but the, you add the epsilon here. So now it becomes positive. So this the inverse of b plus epsilon identity is well defined. And you integrate over x, uh, b plus epsilon identity minus one v, uh, inner product with v here, the inner product is with respect to omega and h, okay? And you multiply by the Keller volume element, okay? You assume this is finite. Now, assuming this, you can find an approximate solution well, you have some control on u epsilon, but actually today I will not use it. It will be used tomorrow. Uh, but you have a somehow stronger control on the error because you have one over epsilon uh, integral uh, of w epsilon square uh, with respect to the volume element is less than uh, the L2 norm here with the inverse of the curvature of V. And observe, and of course, if you want to control the error, you have to multiply by epsilon. So you get epsilon times M of epsilon. So you multiply here by epsilon. But now epsilon divided by this, because, because of this condition, this is bounded by two two times identity. So if V uh, has a control L2 norm and, and goes to zero, then actually you will prove that the error also goes to zero. So it's somehow much easier to control the error than to control the solution in this, in this approach. It's a bit surprising, but anyway, uh, it's going to work. Okay, so now what is the next step in the proof? So you pick a cohomology class in um, your um, K extensor and tensor the quotient of the ideal sheaves. And you can represent it by a Q cocycle with respect to a Stein covering, okay? As usual, so you use the the 
veil uh, isomorphism theorem for sheaves, so le reveil, and uh, by uh, standard arguments of Dolbrook homology, uh, you can represent this by a smooth NQ form by means of a partition of unity, uh, psi i. And here you produce a, an NQ form. Well, the N here comes from the KX here, which is the same as lambda N star X. So you get an NQ form with values with values in L, uh, which is actually uh, defines a comedy class in double comedy that is corresponding to this uh, cycle. Okay, and now the um, of course the cycle uh, the cycle here is with values in this quotient of ideals. But then if you if you refine uh, if you take the Stein covering, uh, it's well known that you can lift uh, any exact sequence uh, gives gives rise to uh, subjective morphism, of course, on on the Stein space. So on on the on the cycle you can lift to I of H. Okay, so you, you have this uh, quotient map here, so you can lift the coefficients to I of H. And now you take the same formula for F twiddle. And now you get uh, the, the cocycles C twiddle uh, I zero IQ are with values in I of H. Unfortunately now del bar F twiddle is not zero. But if you project, if you project it, but image in uh, I of H modulo I of H exponential minus phi is by construction del bar F, which is by assumption zero because you start with a cycle, which means that it's non-zero, but it is in the kernel of this map, which is this ideal. So it means that now this NQ form, del bar F twiddle, is with values in the smaller ideal. And we are going to exploit this. So it's valued here, it's valued in I of H exponential minus psi. Now we are going to truncate. Okay, and we truncate here on this green part. So remember that Y essentially is this uh, Sub variety that is defined by the singularities of psi. Okay, it's defined by the conductor ideal, and actually, it's certainly supported on the polar set. So y is contained in the polar set uh, of poles of psi. I should have observed this before. Okay, so psi essentially is some sort of equation for y. And now you take t to be very very negative, so t will be a close will go to minus infinity and you get some sort of tubular neighborhood where psi is between t and t plus one okay so this sort of uh, hollow tube here in green and then you take a cutoff function theta and multiply your f twiddle by theta of psi minus t so it has support exactly on the green part and now you take the del bar of this and want to solve with a del bar of u t epsilon with respect to this weight here. Of course, you will not be able to do this because of the assumption. So you will do this with some error. And now uh, the point is that you are going to solve with this weight depending on t and depending on the epsilon okay and you will have to adjust to adjust all these data very carefully okay so let us compute now 
So take del bar of theta of psi minus t times f twiddle. So you get two terms, a term where you differentiate f twiddle. So you get del bar of f twiddle. Oh, sorry, this is, should have been, it's, it's not there. Uh, and then you have the derivative of theta, which gives theta prime psi minus t times del bar psi which f twiddle. And the second term, of course, derivative, uh, derivative here vanishes on y because, uh, because you are in the, the support is at the green part. Moreover, uh, the image here I explained is here. So you have coefficients in H of X minus minus psi. Therefore, you are L2, locally L2 with respect to this weight. Sorry, it should be psi here, it's a mistake. Uh, so if you come back to the, uh, the weight of H, you are L2 with respect to this metric here. And now you can truncate because you are, you, you can truncate a little bit the, the base. So you are relatively compact, you have a proper map. So now you can argue, you can argue on a relatively compact subset. Uh, now, I will not detail this because I'm <clears throat> almost over time now, but actually, because you are on a relatively compact uh, subset, you can uh, take quasi perisovarmic regularizations and then they converge by decreasing to the weights phi and psi. And because they are larger than phi and psi, they, uh, the bound that you get are actually uh, less than what you get with phi and psi. And you can also take complete Keller metric. So that's the usual trick of mine I introduced almost 40 years ago. Of course, the, you still have some poles somewhere, but you can take a complete Keller metric. And actually, uh, the omega delta will be larger than omega. And this is enough to, uh, because of the NQ form, so this is enough to have this control here. So you have a uniform control uh, over X prime. And therefore, uh, you can definitely apply uh, the approximate L2 solution. And if you look at what you get for the error with respect to exponential minus phi minus psi, you have to introduce this inverse of curvature, which I, I mentioned is less than two times identity. So one term comes from the derivative of psi and one term comes from the del bar of F twiddle. But it is, but this one is integrable, is locally L2. And now you integrate on something smaller and smaller because you approach, okay, you, you have Y here and you are, you are on a small psi less than T plus one here. So you converge, you converge to Y as T goes to infinity. So by Lebesgue, of course, this first integral goes to zero automatically. Now the, the second term is more subtle. Um, you have to compute and choose adequately uh, the twisting factors. And this is the miracle of, uh, well, this is essentially an improvement of the original paper of Ozawa Tadoshi. If you choose adequately uh, the, the factors, and actually this choice will work. So your function that depends uh, on one variable, depends on the constant alpha here, I will not make the calculation, it's uh, quite tedious. And then you use these twisting factors uh, given by the function beta of uh, sigma t of psi. And you also twist a little bit the, uh, the base metric h0. You multiply h0 by some factor that depends on psi. And if you compute everything, uh, you will see that this second integral now, you can adjust this second integral to be essentially O of exponential t, if you choose correctly. Epsilon will be chosen to be small. Epsilon will be exponential 2t. And if you compute everything, 
then uh, you can check that this final integral goes to zero, which proves that uh, the W, the error here goes to zero and you're done. Okay, for the calculations, I refer you to, uh, well, papers in the literature, so I will send you the list of references. And here, unfortunately, uh, the solution, the solution is not under control. So this is why we have only a qualitative uh, result. Okay, so I'm done for today, except uh, for possibly uh, questions. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. Okay, we are in the room, so just a second. Okay, now, now should be better. So thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. So are there questions? Okay, there is uh, uh, one more question. Shantere, it's on the chat. I think you can read or I can do it for you. Okay, I see that in the chat there is a question by uh, Vasi Pratambingali. Uh, is the complication with errors arising because we are not given an initial holomorphic extension? Uh, this is indeed one of the issue, uh, if we have here, uh, if we are in the Stein situation, we could take right away a holomorphic extension without any norm. And of course, the del bar would be zero here. So you have one term less. Um, but still, that's not enough. Uh, that's not enough. The point is that uh, here, if you, you come back to, um, to the first slide, of course, you may have a non-reduced structure. And uh, the extension that you take, um, is, is far from converging. I mean, what I mean is, okay, let me open a blank page. So you start from F, okay, which is something like this uh, in I of H and assume that H is smooth. You can even assume that you have a smooth metric on L. Okay, so, so this, you can assume that this is just OX, okay? And now you have a, you, you, now you restrict this to, to your Y. So you're actually on Y. And now you wonder whether you can extend to uh, F, which is defined on the, on the whole of X. Okay, but now the point is that you would need some sort of convergence of F square exponential minus psi. But if psi has a lot of singularities, uh, this is not going to converge. This, is, this converges only if your f already vanishes to some order on y. Maybe, maybe an order that is less than given by the ideal sheaf exponential minus psi but maybe by some, uh, some constant tau here less than one, okay? And of course, if, if it converges with, uh, with this weight, you will have a convergent integral. But here, I don't, assume, I don't assume that I have a convergent integral. And quite surprisingly, uh, although there is no L2 estimate for this restriction, uh, still qualitatively we can produce because the truncation, the truncation still has an L2 estimate. And uh, then you, you still have to use the approximation theorem. I cannot do without. Uh, this is maybe a lack of, uh, of technology. So maybe in the future uh, we could recover that. 
but the uh, the answer is negative so the complication is necessary even even in the situation where you have an initial holomorphic extension Other questions? So, if not, uh, I thank uh, I think from uh, everyone, uh, Jean Pierre, for this very nice lecture. And maybe we resume on, on the schedule is uh, 11 15. Maybe we take uh, five more minutes. So, we start at uh, 11 uh, 20. Okay, thank you very much. So, I'm stopping my, my screen.